Your Excellency, the President of the Executive Board, Ms. Rabab Fatima, Permanent Representative of Bangladesh to the United Nations, Executive Director of UNICEF, Ms. Henrietta Four, Deputy Executive Director of UNICEF, Mr. Omar Abdi, Distinguished Members of the UNICEF Executive Board, and Distinguished Guests. First of all, I thank UNICEF for having me on this very special occasion. It is truly an honor for me to be part of this forum. Indonesia has the fourth largest education system in the world, covering more than 640,000 schools, 3 million teachers, and 60 million students. These facts explain some of the challenges of Indonesia's education system due to our population size, diversity, and geographical uh, infrastructure, and, and also uh, barriers as the biggest archipelago in the world. After President Joko Widodo took office last year, the nation has charted a course to realize the vision of Indonesia 2045 in bringing Indonesia's development and prosperity to a new height. Realization of this vision relies on excellent human capital in which education plays a foundational role. We in the Ministry of Education have translated this vision into the concept of Merdeka Blajar. The translation of that is the freedom to learn. There are many, many elements of this philosophy of the freedom to learn that will create transformational change in our education system. Five years is a very, very short time to enact and implement educational reforms. Most educational reforms take 10 to 20 years to see the impact that is permanent and long lasting. So in the next five years, our mission in the Ministry of Education is really to create irreversible change, to go past the tipping point of change that cannot be reversed. There's a few elements of this freedom to learn philosophy. The first is that we must be able to give the freedom for every single teacher to decide to teach at the right level for their student. This is one of the biggest problems in developing nations and educational systems, whereby standardization has taken away the opportunity for children to catch up those have, that have been falling behind previously. So the ability to create both a curriculum and a policy structure that allows teachers to teach at the right level for specifically their students is one of the big changes that we plan to implement. In a country with such diversity, both cultural and in terms of competency, giving the freedom for schools to actually choose the competency levels that match their students' capabilities is the only way for every student to be able to learn at the same time. The second part that is related to that first part is the ability to change the philosophy of the curriculum instead of a set menu where every uh, person or every student at every year level has a uniform curriculum, changing it from a set menu to more like a supermarket, whereby teachers can pick and choose the elements that most uh, match the both competency and uh, the capability level of their student class so creating a curriculum that it gives a lot of freedom to pick and choose which elements of the curriculum are best suited for their students is a very strong corollary to the Merdeka Blajer philosophy. The third is the role of technology. Um, coming from a technology background, I've come to terms during this COVID crisis of the limits of technology and how it can impact the education space. However, we do see in the Ministry of Education technology's primary role as the ability to create equal access for those that may not have access to uh, the greatest teachers, etc., to be able to access those through technology, through remote access. And technology also plays a pivotal role, 
not to substitute teachers, but to actually enhance the capability of teachers to facilitate learning from multiple channels and not just from themselves, but from a variety of media that they can access. Technology also plays a pivotal role in eliminating the bureaucratic burden of a lot of schools and teachers and allows them to spend more time doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is improving learning for their students. And technology and automation and how we manage schools um, can provide, can save a huge amount of time and efficiency so that teachers and principals can focus on what truly matters, which is their students. Now, having said this, the single most important uh, change that we need to make in these schools is the ability to have better talent from teachers to um, principals be able to go and support our most, uh, um, our most uh, furthest and most marginalized uh, provinces and districts. So part of our biggest strategy is a reformulation of both incentives and distribution of master teachers across the nation to really support the schools that need the most. Part of the strategy is a completely revitalization of how our teacher training institutions are run and operated and their selection process and their graduation process. Because we have a lot of teachers that retire every year and this regeneration of, of, an, of, of a new generation of, of teachers is going to be a mission critical element of the educational reform. Ultimately change agents are human and the more of these open-minded, the more of these um, uh, truly uh, student first teachers that go and go to the furthest regions and teach at the, at the schools that need them the most, the more permanent the changes are of our policies. Related to this is actually the focus on principles and to ensure that the criteria and the selection process of principles is are very, very protected and free from other elements that are not purely on the basis of how well they mentor other teachers. So this concept of the principal, not as the operational head, but the principal as the pedagogical head of the school is something we truly believe in. And so the unit of change and innovation in a school is really the school itself. It is not uh, the governing bureaucracy around it. We firmly believe that with a great principle in place, a school can hyper innovate and, and, and improve learning outcomes, um, no matter the current state of, of, of the curriculum uh, or, or even the facilities. The human capital is still the most important aspect of the school's uh, innovation. So we are continuously striving to produce innovations um, to not only increase the student participation rate, but to also improve the distribution of quality education. Technology is one thing, human quality, human and quality talent at every level of our education is the second part. Now we cannot tackle these problems on our own. Thus we must always welcome and encourage more collaborations with other stakeholders, including UNICEF. In this special occasion, allow me to give our appreciation to UNICEF that has continuously supported the ministry in important initiatives, including in our most disadvantaged regions, such as the provinces of Papua, Ndete, and Sulawesi. The program in Papua, for example, has yielded significant results in improving the foundational reading skills among students. At the peak momentum of our reform initiatives, COVID-19 emerged, and we had to implement distance learning for almost half a million schools across the country. The Ministry of Education made it clear that the safety of our children is our number one priority. Subsequently, we made efforts to ensure the continuity of learning from home while gradually reopening schools, starting from the lowest risk zones. UNICEF has provided strategic and technical support to the development of national guidelines on safe school protocols, home-based learning, and school reopening. UNICEF has also provided support in the strengthening of distance learning platforms and materials, particularly focusing on offline learning using TV, 
radio, and printed materials. All those insights were invaluable for us. These have complemented the Indonesian government's efforts in providing support for children living in rural and remote areas. And those are the children that need most help. These are the children whereby online learning is very often not an option. Our challenges are not over yet. Nonetheless, we need to nurture a positive and optimistic attitude that we can overcome by building and strengthening more collaborations. Ministry of Education looks forward to continued and even stronger collaborations with UNICEF to accelerate our educational reform and to create more and more irreversible change in our system. Thank you again for this opportunity in sharing our milestones and challenges in improving the education system in Indonesia. I wish us all good health and success in our many endeavors to come. Thank you very much.